So what we're introduced to in the Balanced View training is the magical, spontaneous nature of reality exactly as it is. And we introduce ourselves to that just by allowing all of the data, all of the descriptions, thoughts, emotions, sensations, any experience, just to be exactly as it is. Just to relax the need to describe everything, to think about everything, to understand everything just to relax and allow ourselves to be exactly as we are, allow reality to be exactly as it is. And the relief of doing that is, is immediate, it's instantaneous. And what happens is that life really begins to change and it switches from this really complicated, challenging, tense experience of trying to manage all of the data, Tr somehow trying to control the way that we feel, trying to keep ourselves happy, make ourselves feel happy, trying to keep the depression or the negativity or the feelings of worthlessness or whatever the difficult experiences are, we keep trying to keep those at bay. And so there's this constant monitoring of everything that's going on. It's, uh, there's no relaxation in that game and there's no power in that game because all of our energy and all of our time and all of our focus goes into trying to manage the data streams. And so when we're introduced to the actual nature of reality and we see for ourselves in our own experience just by relaxing mind and body completely that everything is a completely spontaneous display. Everything happening in a absolutely relaxed, natural, wild display of pure benefit. And there's nothing that we need to do for that to be the case. Our mind thinks as it will, there's this constant stream of thoughts and emotions and physical sensations and things we can hear, the birds chirping in the trees and the, the breeze blowing and it, it's all just doing exactly what it's doing. We've just been told and we've taught ourselves that there are certain datum, certain experiences or thoughts or emotions or physical sensations that, that we really do need to do something about. So good examples of these are what we call afflictive states. So the thought that, um, and this is one that I've been familiar with all of my life, is that um, I'm not good enough and that other people are better than I am or are contributing more than I am, they're cleverer than I am, they're uh, more attractive than I am, they're more experienced than I am, they're more confident in open intelligence than I am. And these are perfect examples of um, how we're going to use our minds. You know, we have this really simple choice and this is what we're introduced to here. We, we know the conventional way of using our mind. We can focus in on any of these descriptions and I know what happens when I do that and it's extremely painful, totally disempowering. This game of comparison, looking at other people, looking at myself, having all of these expectations and never actually managing to live up to them, always feeling like a failure always looking at other people and seeing how happy they are and how brilliant they are and why can't I be like that and they're just contributing so much more than I am and I'm basically just shrinking myself into this this datum trying to squeeze myself into this little identity of this disempowered human being this little person running around completely incapable And actually what happens is that when I allow that day to stream too, just to be exactly as it is, then it's just like the mist in the air. It, it resolves naturally. It's not something that I need to go in and I need to fix and work out why am I the worthless one? Why is everyone else so brilliant? Why do I always end up comparing myself? Why am I always a failure? It's just spinning off into this, this world of descriptions that it's just... Um, for me, it was a source of, of huge isolation because it meant that I, I 
didn't feel that I wanted to be around other people because they were so brilliant, because I felt so worthless. And, and so I isolated myself from other people because it seemed to be probably the best option for me. And then coming to Balanced View and being told that actually, well, you, you're allowed to feel all of these things and not only that, but every other single person in the room on the planet also feels these things. And that, being told that was one thing, but actually testing for myself and to see whether it was safe to feel these things, to allow myself to feel them w without running away from them, without having to avoid or try to avoid everybody else that was around, without trying to replace those thoughts by trying to pretend that I was confident, for example. You know, trying to, yeah, come on, you know, trying to get that confidence going. Yeah, I did it for a bit and then somebody else would do something really brilliant and I'd just collapse again. And, and, and so all of these strategies that I developed just became less and less necessary. And so there was a huge relief in that, just being able to just be myself as I am. With, with, with everything that I think and I feel and I sense and just to allow it to all be exactly as it is. And this sounds like such a simple step, but for me it was completely challenging because I'd never done it before. Never done it before at all. And so the, the, the practice of short moments was, was a beautiful instruction because it, it seemed scary to allow these things to be as they were. I'd, I'd never done it. Well, what's going to happen when I, I, what happens if I don't run away? What happens if I actually f start to face this stuff? That, you know, that's, whoa, that's quite, that's quite a, quite a big ask. Well, okay, well, I'll just do it one short moment at a time, just like testing it. What happens if I relax here and I allow that, that feeling of being completely worthless, of knowing that I'm the most worthless person on the planet, just to be exactly as it is? What, what happens when I do that, even for an instant? And what I discovered was that there was this, it, it self-released naturally. It didn't leave any trace, like a line, line in the air. It was there and then it was gone naturally. But more than that, it, it opened out. It was recognized to be inseparable from the open intelligence by which it was experienced. The open intelligence that's looking through your eyes, listening through your ears, that knows you're here. And it was seen to be this dynamic energy of this intelligence. And then it continued to open out. And I really saw what it meant to emphasize this data. How painful it was for me. How it had made my life so difficult and so challenging. And not only was this the case for feeling worthless and for comparing myself with other people or comparing myself with an ideal about how I thought I should be, but as soon as I saw this within myself, I looked around at everybody else and the deep understanding and compassion that this is what everybody is doing. Just suddenly, it was this heart connection with everybody, seeing what I'd been doing to myself and deeply, deeply recognizing that this is what we're all doing. We're all doing our best. We've just had a rather bizarre education in the nature of mind. And now I have access to a really clear education that is actually aligned with the nature of reality, that allows me to recognize the nature of reality, the nature of data as nothing but this spontaneous display of perfect benefit. And I see that for myself when I allow them to be exactly as they are. And when I allow them to be exactly as they are, they do not have the power over me that I thought they had. And it's wonderful to live a life where the data are not able to dictate the way that I live and the way that I relate and the way that I choose to spend my time. What happens naturally is that because reality is completely beneficial and each short moment aligns us with that completely beneficial nature of reality, everything begins to change. This obsessive self-focus which was never beneficial, which was always painful, always isolating, 
and never actually aligned with reality because I was never on my own. There were always other people around. And even when you go and live in a cave, every single person that you've ever met, every failed intimate relationship, all of your family are there with you in the cave. <laughs> I tested this out. I carried them up in my backpack. It was really annoying. I tried to leave them at the bottom, but they all came with me. So we're always in relationship. And what happens is that these relationships open out and we find ourselves being of benefit. Spontaneously, magically, effortlessly. This is our innate nature. And that's so beautifully reflected in your questions of wanting the best for everybody. Why doesn't science provide us with solutions that are really of benefit to all? Why is that? Why is the focus on profit? Why is the focus on maybe the benefit of certain sections of society or certain countries? Well, why is that? And what became obvious to me is that that is also due to this confusing education in the nature of mind, where the people running these companies, the people funding these companies, have not had access to the correct education in the nature of mind. So they believe that their well-being lies in a certain set of descriptions. So one might be accumulating lots of money. And that's then the rationale for acting in the world. I need to act so I can accumulate lots of money and then perhaps once I've accumulated enough then I'll, I'll be okay, I'll be safe, I'll be comfortable, I'll be able to relax. My experience was that no matter how much money I had or how little money I had, it didn't have any bearing on how relaxed I was. As soon as I focused in on that situation, I could be tense about not having any money or I could be tense about having money and worrying about losing it or not spending it correctly <coughs> or thinking ahead into the future when I didn't have any money. So the opportunity to relax is not dependent on any description, including whether we have money or not. We can relax and allow everything to be exactly as it is. And we see that this driving force, this self-centered activity, this lack of education in the nature of mind is actually the cause for all of the confusion and suffering that we see in the world, both personal, for every single individual, and for us collectively. It's this lack of education, it's this isolating ideas about who we are, focusing on these data streams, that are the cause for all of the conflict, both internal, within groups in society and between nations. It's this misunderstanding, this idea that somehow we are these isolated, disempowered individuals that are completely helpless and hopeless. Now to empower ourselves with open intelligence really allows us to tap into our most comprehensive intelligence as human beings. We have no more fear of afflictive states because we know exactly what they are. They're simply the shine of mind, this grand display of great benefit. They are our power source. One of my favorites is anger. When I get angry, oh, I, I love it. I love it when I get angry because I have learned through this training that I can allow the anger to be exactly as it is without indulging it, without shouting at someone or going off in a, in a huff, stomping off on my own. I don't need to avoid it. I can speak to people that really make me angry and I can remain completely open-hearted there. I can hear people expressing opinions that I really don't like. It's a brilliant training ground. And I don't need to replace it either. I don't need to try and, when the anger comes up, say, no, you're calm, you're not angry, you're calm, stay calm, stay calm. I can allow it all to be exactly as it is and it is transmuted into this fuel for beneficial action. So the afflictive states are here to show us that there are no afflictive states, but we can only see that by encountering them directly in the immediacy of perception allowing them to be exactly as they are, open intelligence's beneficial dynamic display and nothing else. 
But unless you make that decision to allow it to be as it is, you will continue to be a victim to it. And as far as dying and death is concerned, personally I have no idea what's going to happen when I die. I've heard lots of ideas from other people, read lots of things in different books. But I know through my own experience that my training in open intelligence is what prepares me for everything. It prepares me for all data streams. It gives me the confidence and assurance to know the nature of reality. That nature of reality doesn't change whether I'm alive or dead. That nature of reality doesn't change whether I'm sick or well, whether I'm rich or poor, whether I'm Indian or English. The nature of reality is exactly the same, exactly as it is for all of us. And getting to know that just gives you a, a confidence and assurance that you will know where to turn when the data become extremely challenging and unpredictable, which would be all of the time. But I would imagine that will certainly be the case on my deathbed. So to approach that with a, a sense of assurance, really knowing confidently who I am and what the nature of reality is, for me that is a gift of just unimaginable value. And being able to face all of the fear about that. Not needing to avoid, replace or indulge that either. Just becoming comfortable with everything that it means to be human. But you can do that gently, one short moment at a time. You can participate in the trainings that evoke this reality. Dare to develop a relationship with a trainer. Oh. And hang out with the community. All of these things work together to ensure the result of in ever increasing open intelligence potency. So that's what you can choose to enjoy just by being here.